Does Jesus see people's hearts? That's what we'll talk about today in Matthew 8. All right, we have come down the mountain and the crowds are following Jesus. I mean, who wouldn't? After a speech like that, wouldn't you want to know what that guy's going to do next? Of course you would. As he comes down, a leper comes before him and says in ESV, Lord, if you will, can you make me clean? And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and he was clean. This is bad to the Pharisees and to the people there in so many ways. One, a leper is not supposed to come near people. They're supposed to stay way over there. There were limits about how close they could get. Two, you don't touch a leper. This is an incurable disease. Jesus did so, healed the man, and told him he should go show himself to the priest. By showing himself to the priest, that will mean he can rejoin society. But don't tell anyone, because he's not yet ready to tell everyone. We learn in other chapters he tells everybody. But okay, so that was the first healing. Then a centurion comes up upon Jesus, and he wants him to help his paralyzed servant. That's pretty good for a Roman. I don't think Romans care about their servants that much. But he says, don't come into my house. I'm not worthy. It's common in that time that a Jewish person would not enter a Gentile's person house. But he says, well, I can do it from here. And the other interesting thing about the centurion, too, is he recognized a man of power. No one looking, I think, at Jesus or his circumstances would think there's much here other than a wandering prophet until you hear him until you have exposure to him, and then you realize who he is. Because he says, you know what? I get you. I lead people too. I tell people to come and go and do what I say. So I understand what it is to be a man of authority. Jesus heals his servant and tells him, I have seen no one in Israel with such faith. And that when it comes time to be in heaven, Many people will come from the east and the west, meaning outside of Israel, who will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They'll hang out. They'll get to talk to each other. Also means we recognize each people. And we have reclining chairs. I mean, maybe they're reclining booths, but cool. But then there's a lot of people who think they are the sons of the kingdom, meaning they're born into the right lineage, who will find out they're not part of that group. And so the servant was healed, and the servant goes on his way. Of course, Jesus is healing all sorts of people. And eventually, we find out that Peter's mother-in-law is sick, very sick. So since they're in the neighborhood, they go over to Peter's house. She gets up and serves him a meal. And it's kind of funny in the TV show, The Chosen, she just blings right up and starts serving goat cheese. But that's probably what it was like. So then we know that Peter has a mother-in-law. And Matthew points out that this was a prophecy in Isaiah 54, 4, that he is going to heal people. Another I dotted. And Matthew points that out so we know. So a crowd keeps gathering around Jesus. And so he says, you know, what? I don't want to go to the other side of the lake. And the scribe comes up to him and says he wants to follow him. He wants to come too. And Jesus tells him, you know, if you follow me, your life will change. You won't have a house. You won't have a place to stay. You won't have certainty that you probably have now. And Jesus tells him so using an allusion towards animals, a fox, a bird. They all have their homes. But in this lifestyle, Jesus doesn't have a home and he wouldn't either. I think, again, this is one of those situations where Jesus is reading the mind of someone and knows what matters to this person the most. Would he say, I'll give that up just so I could come with you? But we never hear of that person again, and so we assume he goes away. But still, it's an interesting point because it shows it wasn't just the common people who were interested in Jesus. Lots of people were interested in Jesus, including the very people he was talking about having bad practices. They were starting to hear Jesus' word and starting to follow him too. Then the next person comes up to Jesus and says, hey, I want to follow you, but I have to go bury my father. This seems to be another very specific case. It's not telling any of us these kinds of things. This was one conversation to this one person. Maybe that wasn't true. Maybe his father wasn't dead. 
Maybe he was just delaying like, oh, I'll gladly follow you a week from Monday. You know, it's, it was like an excuse not to do it now. Whatever reason, Jesus didn't believe it. You know, and this points out that not everyone, while they can be a believer in Jesus, should be a disciple in that type of an honor position where he's following Jesus around like the apostles. So they get in a boat to cross the sea, and the sea is about seven miles by 13 miles. And in some estimates, you know, the internet's never wrong. It would take about six hours to cross the lake in good weather. One of the things about the Sea of Galilee is it's pretty shallow. And so it's very susceptible to wind and storm. My thing is, is every time I talk to someone about the Sea of Galilee, I've met a couple of people who have gone through it. They say that every time they're in a boat in the Sea of Galilee, a storm comes up. It seems to be a thing. But they get in the boat and they're going to cross over to go to the other side. Big storm comes up. Jesus is sleeping. Now, first of all, it shows a man who can rest, has no worries. When you don't worry about things, you sleep like a baby at night because you know your Father in Heaven is taking care of you. Some people have suggested that Jesus was just pretending to sleep. And so when the storm came up and all the apostles started panicking and the disciples and other people who were in the boat, he was kind of snickering like, ha ha ha, I knew you wouldn't stay calm and not worried. I just got on the mountain telling you not to worry. And here you are worried. So he gets up. I believe he was sleeping because it says he was sleeping. And they woke him up and he rebukes the wind. Boy, I wish I could rebuke the wind. We've had some nasty weather here lately, and if I could rebuke the wind, that would be awesome. But it all calmed down, and everyone was astonished in that boat. Wow, someone who can command the wind. It's interesting, because I think that at that point, Jesus must be going, okay, you've seen me raise people from the dead. You've seen me heal people. I speak with authority on God's forgiveness, how you should live your lives, how you should treat other people. And you're surprised I can calm the wind, but okay, that's cool. Jesus goes to the other side of the lake. The ESV calls it the Gadarenes, which is over more towards east in what would be Jordan today. And a lot of people who, again, dislike the Bible say, see, Matthew's wrong. There's no city. And, you know, well, anyway, they think it's called Umcase. It was a city that was about five miles southeast of the lake. Josephus said, and this is the reason why they think it was, that men lived in tombs. So this was probably outside the city in these tomb areas. And it says the region of the Gadarenes, not the Gadarenes or Gadara itself. This was a pretty cool place. There's more details in other gospels that we'll see about this particular scripture. So anyway, it, Jesus goes to this other side. And you can imagine the apostles and the disciples who were with Jesus at this point, they probably don't want to go there. This is not Israel. This is not their people. These are not Jewish people. While Capernaum was a mixed group of people, this was Gentile area entirely. So they probably really didn't want to go there. And especially if people are living in tombs, that would probably be one, unclean, but two, yuck. And three, that's kind of creepy. So Jesus wants to go over there. And so he does go over there with his disciples. And he sees two demon-possessed men. I mean, they're sleeping in the tombs. What did you expect? They're coming out of the tombs, like they said, and they were so fierce, they were so creepy that no one could go that whole way. The demons cry out. They recognize Jesus as the Son of God. If you come to torment, I mean, this is right out of horror movie stuff. In the backdrop, there is, and if this were a movie, you would know what's going to happen next, a bunch of herd of pigs sitting in the backdrop. and. They were feeding, you know, a little bit of distance off to the side. And so the demons begged Jesus to cast them into that herd of pigs, I guess, as compared to destroying them or leaving them completely bodiless. It's hard to know. But as soon as they went into the pigs, the whole herd, someone said 2,000, rushed down the banks into the waters and drowned themselves. And the people who were the herdsmen, they got out of there because this is super creepy. And so then the whole town comes out and you would say, wow, that's so nice that you depossessed two of the people who were scaring us so. But instead they were all like, hey, you know, could you just leave? And begged him to get away from the area. <laughs> well, that's a kind of a horrifying and a little bit funny imagery there. But it reminds me of the difference. We'll get to this later. But when we have the woman at the well and she runs into town and tells 
everyone what Jesus has done. Now everyone's interested in Jesus, probably saving that entire town and introducing them to Jesus. In this case, they were like, yeah, could you get out of here? Those pigs were probably expensive, mostly our dinner, and now we're there. People have asked, and when I was trying to do research, why did the pigs run into the water? That's really weird. From most of the scripture references, demons only can destroy. That It's all they can do. And so all they could do once they were pigs is just go kill themselves because they can't just exist. They must destroy life. So that was their only option, I guess, to do that. Interesting. Creepy. And our first horror story in the Bible. So when did this take place? This was uh, probably the same day, the same week as the last chapter, because he was just coming off of the mountain. It's a big, long day. But, you know, here's the interesting thing is I think that when you're omniscient, I don't know, I'm not omniscient, so it's hard for me to say. But when people come up to Jesus, like the leper, heal me, or the centurion, would you heal my servant? And you may say, gosh, all these people are interrupting Jesus. But when you're omniscient, you know this is going to happen. So this is like, You look at your daily planner. Okay, leper came by, check. Centurion came by, check. Woman touched my robe, check. You know, and so it's um, a a little bit interesting because you know who is going to come your way and what is going to happen. When various people come and talk to Jesus, it's interesting because they must think, oh, you're disturbing our Lord when he is going, okay, everything is going according to plan. You must know who everyone is and what's about to happen. So who's in this chapter? We have Jesus, the apostles and other disciples, the crowd, the centurion who really liked his servant. That is so cool. The scribe who wanted to follow Jesus, but wasn't going to get certainty or a great place to live once he does this. The man who wanted to bury his father, demonic pigs, their caretakers, and the town who wanted them to just get out of there. So interesting chapter for sure. Some key words in this particular chapter is healing. The crowds again. The fact that when people are healed, Jesus, in this case, touched them. In the one case of the centurion, he healed the servant remotely without touching them at all. So healing can take different flavors. I'm always curious about that. We're going to see more healings with some more measures later on. Why the different ways to heal? We're going to figure that out. We have that image of the storm on the seas. Jesus just got done telling them to have faith and not be anxious about anything. And yet here they were panicking. And then the last, of course, are demon-possessed people people being attacked by demons, driving them to the point of madness. So they're so scary, people won't even go near them. And then rushing into these pigs and the pigs offing themselves. So weird. Are there literary statements in this particular piece? When the scribe wants to go, I guess here's an interesting one where it is. He says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nest but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So that is a figurative language about how Jesus doesn't have a home. He also says, when the man says he wants to go home and bury his father, he says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Well, obviously the dead cannot bury their own dead. That sounds kind of gross and scary too. This is a scary chapter. But again, a figure of speech that was specific for that man. And so there's our literary aspects of it. What does this say about the nature of God? I mean, whenever you see this, Jesus is healing. He has compassion on his people. And he's looking out for those key people who are faithful, who honor him in different ways. The leper knelt before him, walking in the midst of people, which he was not allowed to do, and begged him, Lord, called him Lord, you can make me clean. The centurion recognized him as a man of authority and called him Lord. And when people don't have faith, they become afraid. They, again, it's that foundation. When your foundation is on the rock of Jesus, it should rebuke the winds. It should also fight back the weather. But these people at that moment were sinking sand. So it was hard on them. 
And just the fact that Jesus goes now to this other side of the lake, which is not part of Israel, not part of the Jewish territory. Jesus is a savior for everybody. Now they told him to leave, but his intention is to reach everybody. What does this say about God's plan? I think that this says about God's plan that he looks for faithfulness in people. He wants it to be all people. And he cares about their day-to-day lives, whether they're possessed by demons or they're harmed or injured in some sort of way he can heal. What does it say about the nature of humanity? There are some people who are faithful and there's some people who have faith, but only to the point. They're not willing to go that extra distance to leave homes of comfort, to leave whatever it is the man who wanted to bury his father was going to leave, or unable to see that Jesus healed two men who were possessed by demons at the cost of some pigs. We all have our limitations. I mean, I think of it too. You know, what were those things that Jesus would say to me that would be the deal breaker? I mean, you have to really think about that. You would hope you would be like Peter, like Matthew. Jesus says, follow me and you go. But then you wonder what I think about the fact that my house is really comfy, what I think about my job, which I really need, what I think about all those things. And Jesus would say, all right, follow me, but quit your job. Well, I can't quit my job. That's how I pay my bills. Hmm. So it's, it's interesting about human nature and that and how that entire town re- rejected Jesus over some pigs. Hmm. Okay. So the central message of the chapter, I think, is faithfulness, that you had many people at the beginning who were faithful. You had the people in the boat, the disciples and the apostles who were not faithful. And you had that town who really just wanted their pigs back. So that's, I think, the central message is being faithful to God. And as the chapter mentions, what does God require, desire, or intend for us to do is to be faithful, have that trust in God and lose our fears and anxiety. I mean, probably the reason those people were mad about their pigs is that's what they were going to have for dinner. That was their wealth, were raising those pigs and selling meat. You know, I mean, that was a, probably a huge loss of money, but that's what mattered to them the most. I have thinking to do, and so my meditation this week is going to be about that thing that would cause you to turn away from God when he says, follow you. Is it the comfy bed? Is it the fantastic job? Is it the herd of pigs that you really were planning on having bacon the next day? Or was it whatever story you said about burying your father that probably wasn't true? What circumstance would I follow Jesus and which circumstances would I turn back? And what I'm going to pray for is that my faith is better, stronger, so that when I lay it on the line, when Jesus says to follow me in some way, I would say yes. I I think that's my prayer after all of this. And what am I going to share? I'm going to share that message of knowing what's important. People going out of their way to get their servants healed, their mother in laws healed, their Lepers getting themselves healed, people following Jesus and giving up everything, compared to the people who are anxious, who care about their pigs more than they care about the Lord. I I want to share with people the importance of that kind of faith in Jesus. All right, everyone, thanks so much. In theory, my website is getting fixed this week. I hope this podcast reaches you, but if it doesn't, it's just going to be delayed by a day or two. But In the links in the show notes, there's a Notion database. The Notion database will have the worksheet always that you can download. Once my website's up and running, I'll have a download section. You'll be able to grab them from two. It will also have links to the podcast. So for whatever reason, for a while, my website for the podcast is broken. That link in the Notion database might work. So it's always a resource that's there for you. It also has some other information. I'm classifying each of the chapters and I'm using ChatGPT to create all the images from each of the chapters. Theologically correct. But when it comes to historically correct, I don't know. Joseph had a nightstand and I think he had a book on his nightstand and then he had a clothes rack. I don't think that that was time period correct, but kind of fun. 
in a chat GPT kind of way. And I won't even tell you what happened when I asked chat GPT to create the temptation of Jesus so I could post it on the blog article. Woo, it got scarier and scare. It was almost as scary as those pigs. But if you want, you can email me at jill at smallstaffswithgod.com and I'll tell you, I'll even send you images of what horrible things that um, ChatGPT tried to create for the temptation of Christ. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Next time, we are looking at Matthew 9. Matthew 9.